damage heavy in two early morning fires. Engineers give the all clear to rail traffic on the swing bridge. And Rob Ford's lawyer challenges police to release the video. Good evening and thank you for being with us. It was a very busy morning for Thunder Bay Fire and Rescue crews. Calls came in regarding two structural fires, one at Almada Pole Street and the other at Frankie and Johnny's Auto Body. Fire crews were able to extinguish both blazes and the scenes were cleared without any injuries. However, both businesses sustained some major damage. Courtney Rutherford has details. Thunder Bay firefighters were called to a building on May Street at around 3.45 in the morning. Upon arrival at the single-story structure, crews found what appeared to be nothing at first. But after finding smoke from the rear, the smoke then turned into flames, which prompted a second alarm to be called. The upholstery shop suffered heavy damage throughout. We're beginning our investigation. We've got the scene secured and uh, we're documenting and examining the evidence at this time. So it was a second alarm, so uh, at least uh, four pumpers were called. Approximately three hours later, Thunder Bay fire crews were called to Frankie and Johnny's auto body, located about six blocks away on North Vicker Street. Just before seven in the morning, a report came in that there was thick smoke billowing through the air. No one was believed to have been in the building when the fire began. District Chief Glenn Graydon says they aren't sure where the fire initially started. But it appears to be extensive both to the building and the vehicles inside. Right at this point, we're really not sure what we have here. Obviously, there has been a fire here. Uh, it came in as a, a, a shift change, so the, the other shift that was here basically did most of the work. We're just doing the, the overhaul part. Uh, I believe that there was uh, five pumper trucks and an aerial ladder here this morning. Both fires are currently under investigation. Thunder Bay Fire Rescue officials say more information will be released depending on what the investigators find throughout the day. Courtney Rutherford, TBT News. There was a show of unity today between the Mayor of Thunder Bay and the Chief of the Fort William First Nation. The two came together at City Hall to speak out against recent racist remarks posted online following the fire on the James Street Swing Bridge. The two leaders say that fire has brought to light another dreadful situation here. Dennis Ward has more. Chief George Ann Morriso believes some of the racist comments posted online recently are made out of ignorance, others out of hatred. But she didn't come to Thunder Bay City Hall to lay blame. She wanted the two leaders to stand side by side to show they will work together. The chief believes the situation may have created an opportunity. First and foremost, she believes the two communities must recognize each other as equals. We as, as, as a First Nation and the City of Thunder Bay need to now focus in on what types of measures we can put in place to try and get rid of this whole notion, this whole archaic ideology of not being able to live with one another because of the, our race or the color of our skin. What does that process look like? I have no idea. But I know that standing here today is the first step. Mayor Keith Hobbs says there should be no tolerance for racist or hateful acts in the city, even if it is coming from a small minority. And it is a small minority that uh, want to raise their ugly head and uh, you know do things like vandalize a teepee at the university, or uh, you know, and we don't know who uh, was responsible for the fire yet. That's under investigation. Uh, but uh, despite uh, whatever their race is. Um, you know, those kinds of acts are unacceptable in this community and we're going to take those people head on. Both the mayor and the chief say these recent events are a wake-up call and add more than ever a joint meeting is needed between the two councils, something that hasn't happened formally since 2011. Dennis Ward, TBT News. A portion of the James Street Swing Bridge has been reopened. Rail traffic resumed this morning, less than three days after a massive fire scorched the north end approach to the bridge. An Ontario Fire Marshal's investigator wrapped up his on-site probe yesterday, but it could be weeks until forensic samples are examined to try to determine the cause. The Fire Marshal's office turned the bridge over to CN Rail yesterday afternoon. Repair crews quickly got to work, replacing damaged rails and rail ties. The first train rolled over the bridge at about 11 o'clock this morning. Our bridges and structures um, engineers, our rail bridge experts, they got in there, they did the work that they needed to do. Um, and that's been completed and then safety is our number one priority. We wouldn't have, you know, resumed train traffic if we weren't 100% confident 
on our engineering side. For our stakeholders. Superior Elevator General Manager Darren Dalio says the resumption of rail traffic was very welcome news as his grain elevator is on the other side of the Cam River. He says they're expecting to have a ship in port on Sunday and they would have had a serious problem if they couldn't get any grain cars to their elevator. Meanwhile, the roadway over the swing bridge remains closed for the time being. CN officials say a consulting engineer will spend the next four or five days assessing the damage and estimating repairs. We are experts when it comes to rail bridges, but the roadway portion needs to be evaluated by someone who can properly, you know, properly look at what is, what is required. So it must be evaluated by a, a road bridge expert. They started it last night, and we expect that they're going to prepare a condition report but that won't be ready till probably next week, midweek. Around 9,000 vehicles normally use the swing bridge every day. For now, drivers will have to continue using the longer route along Chippewa Road and Highway 61. The Thunder Bay District Health Unit has issued a warning to consumers after an employee at a city fast food restaurant was diagnosed with hepatitis A. The health unit says the worker was employed at the Wendy's restaurant on Red River Road. They say anyone who consumed food from the restaurant between October the 11th and the 26th may have been exposed to the hepatitis A virus. However, they add the risk of getting the infection is very, very low. Now, people who consume food from the restaurant during the mentioned period should be on the lookout for the following symptoms. Fever, loss of appetite, abdominal pain, tiredness, nausea, vomiting, dark urine, pale stools, or yellowing of the skin or eyes. Symptoms can develop anywhere from 15 to 50 days following exposure. The health unit also says this appears to be an isolated case and that there have been no other reported cases of Hepe in the district. Now, late this afternoon, Wendy's responded to the situation. They say the restaurant was temporarily closed last night and completely sanitized under the guidance of the health unit. And they say there is no current risk to health to their customers or their employees. It was a year ago today the Ontario Power Authority announced it was suspending the conversion of the Thunder Bay Generating Station. While there's been some progress, the, province, the provincial government still hasn't made an announcement regarding the future of the site. The issue is being raised at the fall conference of the Thunder Bay District Municipal League and some frustration is building. Matt Scooby has more. 365 days later and still very little to show for their efforts. The Common Voice Northwest Energy Task Force has submitted another report to Energy Minister Bob Chiarelli. This time it's a response to the Ontario Power Authority's plan for the Dryden area. They mostly agree with the plan, with the glaring exception being the lack of a role for the Thunder Bay Generating Station. And co-chair Larry Hebert Part says the frustration, the frustration is we're mounting. Having, we're all volunteers and they have a lot of paid people that should be doing their homework. And as far as we're concerned, they're not doing their homework. We're doing it for them. We've prepared extensive plans over the last couple of years on different aspects of energy in northwestern Ontario. And every time we meet with them, oh yeah, that's a good point. Uh, well, we were talking to the people. Well, who are you talking to? Well, they're not talking to the issue is one of many being raised at the fall conference of the Thunder Bay District Municipal League. Hebert brought it up to open the conference and co-chair Ian Angus is planning a more detailed presentation on Saturday. Jim Vesna is a councillor for O'Connor Township and a member of the Energy Task Force. He's more optimistic about the situation and says the OPA has a much better understanding of the region's energy needs because of the work they've done. I wouldn't call it frustrating. I mean, obviously there are times you want to turn around and bang your head against the wall. Don't get me wrong about that. But for the most part, it's not frustrating. It's actually... Uh, it's a challenge, okay, and as it's moved forward, for the most part, we have seen um, some of our goals realized, so I wouldn't be frustrated by it. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, at the way it's going now, I'm kind of hopeful. Thunder Bay Atacokan MPP Bill Morrow also addressed delegates today. He touched on many issues, including the energy situation in northwestern Ontario. Morrow thought the current conversion of the Atacokan coal plant was going to be more difficult than the Thunder Bay station, but it's been an ongoing issue. It hasn't been a year, it's been 10 years. So as I've said, two of those five plants were in my riding. I've been working on maintaining both of those plants for fully 10 years. We believe we're close to having an announcement on the Thunder Bay Generation Station uh, in the near term. I'm not in a position to say exactly when that will be. While that's a line the task force has been listening to for the past year, there is a positive with this latest development. Hebert says Minister of Northern Development and Mines Michael Gravel is encouraged by the report. He plans to share it with Minister Chiarelli and Hebert is hopeful that the long-awaited meeting with the Energy Minister could take place sometime in the next two weeks. Matt Scooby, TVT News.
A pair of Thunder Bay police officers have had their appeals denied by the Ontario Police Civilian Commission. The two drug enforcement officers were found guilty last year of unlawful exercise of authority after a 50-year-old man was roughed up and arrested without any real evidence. Following their convictions, Sergeant William Mochuk was ordered to undergo remedial training and had to forfeit eight hours of pay. His partner, Detective Constable Brad Bernst, received a reprimand along with an order to undergo remedial training. The two officers appealed their convictions and the case was reheard in Toronto on October 2nd. In its decision, released on Wednesday, the Civilian Police Commission says it agrees with the original hearing officer's conclusion that the police officers lacked the objective grounds to arrest the man, thereby making the arrest unlawful. The lawyer for the two officers, Seth Weinstein, did not respond to our request for comment. City police are reminding parents to double-check Halloween candy after a report came in of a needle being found in treats. A parent reported the find to police after the child returned home from trick-or-treating in the Kekebeka Falls Village area. Police say they're investigating whether it was done intentionally or by accident. Police are also looking into a shooting incident at a city park involving a BB gun. It happened Tuesday evening in the Fitzgerald and Cumberland Street area. Police say the gun was discharged by a 16-year-old boy with the BB striking another 16-year-old in the face, almost hitting him in the eye. The victim required treatment in hospital. The weapon has been seized as the investigation continues. The annual university rankings from McLean's Magazine are in and Lakehead University is celebrating their achievements. This year, LU jumped up two spots to 10th place among the 19 undergraduate universities in Canada. McLean's also ranked Lakehead second in Ontario when it comes to student-faculty ratio, student services, and for scholarships, awards, and bursaries. LU's Vice President of Academics says the results are gratifying because it recognizes the hard work of faculty, staff, and students. For a very intimate uh, style experience for students. We have small class sizes and um, uh, uh, the student-faculty uh, or the, the student-to-faculty ratio is very favorable at Lakehead University versus other large mega, mega schools. Uh, students can come here and get to know their professors, uh, sit in a classroom, um, and, and, and really get that one-on-one -on -one experience. And he says the university is excited about this year's results and they also plan on announcing the start of some new programs to be offered next year. A new photo contest is promoting the importance of being visible when walking or biking outside at night. The district's health unit, the City of Thunder Bay and Eco Superior have all teamed up to launch Get Your Shine On. It's a Facebook photo contest that promotes wearing bright colors in poorly lit conditions. Grand prizes are available for anyone who snaps the best photo. Marita Campbell is a public health nurse at the health unit. She says the contest is part of the Be Seen campaign. 57% of pedestrian fatalities occur at night or in dim light hours. So in Thunder Bay, with we have so, such extended uh, darkness, um, that's something we really need to look at. The contest begins today and runs until November 29th. If you went all out on Halloween pumpkins and decorations this year, there is a better place to bring them simply than throwing them out. Eco Superior, along with the City of Thunder Bay and Recool Canada, is encouraging residents to help turn them into compost. The annual Great Pumpkin Compost Collection is underway across the city. The project's been taking place since 1995 and has seen nearly 350 tons of pumpkins end up in the municipal composting site as opposed to the dump. Shannon Costigan is the Waste Reduction Program Coordinator for Eco Superior. She says it's not only pumpkins that can go into the bins, but bales of hay and corn stalks can also be dropped off. Well, it is important for people to think about what's garbage and what isn't, because we want to make sure that our landfill isn't being overrun with waste that could be diverted. So it's important for people to know that. The city does offer the compost back to residents free of charge every spring. Costigan reminds people to not put plastic bags or anything else that does not compost into those bins. Now the collection bins are available at the Lakehead Labour Centre, County Fair Plaza and the West Fort Playfield where they will remain until November 15th. Until recently, a form of cancer that kills more than 4,400 men each year was rarely spoken of. But the return of the moustache has had a big impact and created a national dialogue about prostate cancer. The month formerly known as November has become Movember, and some believe it's been a game changer in the fight against the disease. Today, prostate cancer survivors, the mayor and members of the Lakehead University Thunderwolves started the month with a clean shave. For the next 30 days, their mows will go untouched. John Hendel has been fronting the local campaign since it began four years ago, but this year it's a little more personal from him and his because his father was recently diagnosed with prostate cancer. 
He says hair on the upper lip starts a dialogue. After that conversation happens, we can now talk about issues that normally men don't talk about. You know, mental health issues. That's another new area of this, uh, this year's campaign. When is the last time that guys got together and talked about mental health issues? This is not uh, an area that we are comfortable with speaking about. Same with prostate cancer, testicular cancer. It's all creating that dialogue. Prostate cancer survivor Phil Janilla says early detection is the first line of defense. It still has an impact on him and his family as he also lost a few friends in the past year. The former president of the Prostate Cancer Network of Thunder Bay feels that the Movember campaign has made a big difference locally. I've seen more men uh, and women, I've seen more families talking about men's health issues, uh, prostate cancer, testicular cancer, mental health issues uh, than ever before. Uh, people like, and people are now supporting it. Canada-wide, the Movember campaign raised close to $43 million 